Andy Johnson, today we, today I, am talking about mental health issues. This is a lecture I never really wanted to make, but here I am talking about it. This is focused on teachers and professors. However, my audience is all of humanity. Teachers, pre-K and 12 schools, professors at colleges and universities. But mental health issues are common to a whole bunch of people. Now, I've been working in higher ed for over 25 years. I have a mental health condition, anxiety disorder and uh, major depressive disorder. Sometimes I've been successful with this condition. Sometimes it's got in the way. I've recently come to understand it more and it helps to understand. I've been in education a total of 37 years. I was in the elementary schools for a while before I went back. At least 11 of these 37 years, this thing was undiagnosed. So I did not understand why I was the way I was, why I reacted the way I was. I thought I was just a a-hole at times. <laughs> Mental health. The reason I'm talking about it is because it is not sufficiently talked about and I'm talking with people on our campus here and I find there's more professors that are afraid to talk about it. They're afraid of the personal stigma attached. Oh boy, someone will think there's something wrong with me. Someone will think I'm a kook or a monster or worse. And the professional stigma. Oh boy, I won't get a job. I won't get a promoted. They, they won't trust me with that. So it's these stigmas attached. And I know before I had my own condition, I had an attitude about those people. I remember uh, when I was very, in my 20s or 30s, I was dating a woman and I saw the bottle of Prozac on the refrigerator and oh, that's the end of that. So I was on the other side of not thinking too highly about this. It's a mental health condition, part of the human condition, a variation on the human theme. I don't like to call it illness. I don't like to call it disorder. For me, it is a condition that I've lived with. It's part of the way I am wired. Now, I didn't ask to be this way. I didn't ask to have this thing inside me. There's positive and negative aspects. The positive is it's given me a certain amount of energy to write, to succeed. And the way my brain thinks, it's enabled me to write a lot, very creative, think laterally. When I was a competitive athlete, it gave me a lot of anger and fire to, com uh, to compete, but there's negative aspects. It has really gotten away with interpersonal things at times, both professionally and personally. The whole idea, is it a disability? Well, I call it a disability. I have to call it a disability simply to get an accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. <clears throat> Disability is based on the myth of normal, disability of any kind. This is normal, you're not it, you're deficient, you're deviant, I hate that sort of thinking. A condition, whether it's physical or psychological, seen or non-visible disability, mental health disorders are called non-visible disability, this condition becomes a disability only when there's restrictions or impediments in place. If you have a wheelchair, not a big deal, but you don't have elevators and ramps and whatnots, big deal. Then it becomes a disability. Same with mental health conditions. If we have certain accommodations in place, not a big deal. It enables us to do the essential functions of our job, and that's what we want. Now, at some point in their lives, one out of four people, one out of four of you watching this, will experience some sort of mental health condition. It's not common. Uh, it's, it's not always permanent. As well, why should we talk about it? Well, here's the thing. Suicide is the second leading cause of death of college-age students. Why are we not talking about this more? The third leading cause of death of high school-age students. Why are we not talking about this more to say nothing of drug and alcohol abuse? Why are we not talking about mental health conditions more, for God's sakes? Three common misunderstandings. Common misunderstanding, one, number one, you can just get over it. Just get over it. This is especially true of depression. Just snap out of it. Well, if we could, we would, but we can't just get over it. The second one is you can take a pill. Just take a pill and you'll be fine. 
A pill by itself, medication by itself, rarely, rarely solves all the problems. It might give you a little buffer where you can address the problems, but any sort of psychotropic medication must be taken with psychotherapy or talk therapy. A lot of hard work on my part or your part uh, addressing how I think, plus vigilance. So you can't just take a pill and get better. It's not like that. And the common misunderstanding is that it's a precise standardized experience, that all people with depression act the same way and need the same thing and need the same. It's not like when you have a physical illness, it's more standardized then, uh, but it is not precise or standardized. So all people are not the same. Now, the experience itself, the most common ones are depression and some form of anxiety. Anxiety disorders come in a whole variety of flavors and I'm not going to go into it here today. Post-traumatic stress disorder is another common one as well. And the second one is bipolar disorder. In the old days, we called this manic depressive. And there's varying degrees of all of these things, especially uh, bipolar disorder, where you have manic episodes and depressive episodes or stages to and varying degrees. There's bipolar one, bipolar two, et cetera, et cetera. We put labels on things and we somehow think they're more real. We see more of it today. Why is that? Well, because we know what it is. <laughs> we know what it is. So, of course, we see. Back in the day, back in the day, we just thought the person was kind of an a-hole or there was something wrong with them or they were just a kook. And, of course, we internalized all that. Oh, there's something wrong with me. Well, I don't know if there's something wrong with me, but there's this condition that causes me to think and act in certain ways, and I don't like that. And in the old days, of course, there was a whole lot of drugs and alcohol poured on top of it. So you didn't see some of the anxiety. Uh, you didn't see some of the mental health conditions. Now, comorbidity, there's more than one condition and anxiety and uh, depression often go together, but as well, substance use disorders. And here's the thing, we sometimes self-medicate with drugs and alcohol, and I know I did for many, many years, sometimes self-medicate, and that takes care of the anxiety and maybe depression on the short term, but it makes things a lot worse and you're not able to address it. So drugs and alcohol, never good for a mental health condition. What is an anxiety disorder? I tell people, it's like someone coming up behind you and saying, boo! And it's having that feeling all the time. It's a dysregulated fight or flight mechanism. Oh boy, you have a hard time achieving homeostasis or coming down from that fight or flight. You get worked up more and you have a hard time bringing it down. Anxiety disorder. I don't like the word anxiety because people say, oh, I'm worried all the time. Well, I'm not worried, but I am a little on edge at times and angry at times as well. Depression. Oh boy, that really sucks. I went through this a couple of times in my life and the brain just doesn't work. Overwhelming sadness, hopeful, hopelessness, just dark, dark, dark. And I, I experience this sometimes today, but it also manifests with anger and irritability. All right. That is can be a form of depression. And I know I'm slipping back into it when I catch myself swearing all the time. Suicide ideation. That means you think about death. Doesn't mean you contemplate the act, but you think about not existing or you think about the act. That does not mean that you're going to actually contemplate doing it. Suicide ideation, thinking about it. Both of these can have physical impacts impacting your sleep. I know I've been to the emergency room several times because the stress, you get these back spasm stuff and you just can't function, can't sleep, can't eat. They can have physical impacts. So what can we do in our pre-K schools, pre-K 12 colleges, other things? What can we do? And this goes to all of humanity. First, affirm a common goal. We want all teachers and professors to be able to achieve their full potential in order to contribute fully to our schools, colleges, universities, and societies. We want 
everyone to be able to do the essential functions of, of our jobs. So that is the first one. We all want people to succeed. The second thing, what can we recognize that the condition exists? Yes, people have mental health conditions. It's more common than you think. It's a real thing. People aren't just trying to get out of work or get special treatment. It is a part of the human condition. So let's talk about it. The third thing, sometimes you have to look beyond the behavior to see what precipitated it. This is not to excuse behavior, but sometimes you have to consider people in the circumstances that led to the behavior. I know of a professor working in a department, and that department knew that person had a mental health condition, and they kind of weaponized it because they didn't agree with them, so they created the conditions over time where that professor eventually erupted. All right, professor didn't want to, but over time it creates that toxic condition. So then they're able to point to the behavior. Aha, see, I told you. Confirmation bias. I see that person's a bad person. So that professor had to live with that behavior and that professor always had to be in control. So sometimes, and again, this is not to excuse bad behavior, but you always have to say what precipitated that behavior. Because many times, those behaviors can be avoided. And again, not to excuse bad behavior. Times and schedules. Now, university level, college level, this is easier because we can schedule classes. But sometimes people function better at different times, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in, in the evening. One person with a non-visible disability simply needed a 20-minute nap during the day or to teach in smaller bits, and I know this is harder at the pre-K level. Other environmental things, like simply having windows or seasonal affect disorder lamps or lighting, other environmental modifications can help. And these are simple things that you can do without having an ADA accommodation. Now, a lot of the pressure points are meetings, department meetings, faculty meetings. So modifying that in some way, either not requiring or partial attendance at meetings, because yes, that can create a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lot of depression. If the person is not going to the meeting, you need to have agendas fully prepared so that person can be fully aware of what's going on and can contribute to that department meeting and well and meeting minutes as well detailed enough it takes a commitment now if a person can't be at meetings that does not mean that that person does not want to be engaged so it takes a commitment by by uh, colleagues and chairs or principals or whoever to keep that person fully informed and engaged and seven one seven number seven Okay, this is at the university where we strive often to be an egalitarian thing where the people make decisions. We don't have someone ordering us around. We must understand what democratic process is using Robert's rules of order. Some people think that a democratic process is just taking a vote. Absolutely not. It's much, that is an under understanding of what democratic process is. It's checks and balances to make sure that all voices are heard and no single voice uh, dominates. I found on campus, I and other people have found that support groups are essential because no one understands, no one understands us better than us. So we have created a support group that has been a lifesaver on our campus over the last couple of years. We need to, faculty, teachers, demand that our supervisors know and understand the federal law related to the Americans with Disabilities Act. I found out the hard way that they don't. Sometimes they blatantly violate federal law and that is unconscionable in this day and age. And we need to demand that HR be fully trained and in compliance with the American with Disabilities Act. And we should be able to see, uh, tell me, what training you had, what training you had. Couple other things, and this is just an awareness of our human interactions. Awareness 
of how they contribute to racism, ableism, ableism, sexism, homophobia, religious bigotry, wealth and corporatism, cultural superiority, paradynamic parochialism. That my view is right, all right? So we need to be aware of bully, and I wish there were a softer word than that, but there is sometimes implicit, you're not aware of it, and sometimes explicit. Bullying by majority, when someone brings up a minority view and they're, they're, they're demeaned. No, you shouldn't believe that. This is what we believe. You're wrong. All right. You can agree with the idea. You can, you can, uh, you can disagree with the idea, but not with the person. You don't demean the person. Bullying by seniority. We see that a lot in college campuses. People feel very insecure if they haven't got full tenure. Or, or, or a full promotion or tenure. They see how senior faculty interact and can empower. And people on a college campus know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, Pre-K-12 schools, you probably understand that a little bit as well. That oftentimes those who have seniority can bully and demean. So be aware of that. Soft bully. Bullying, and I wrote this out because that's the best way. Soft bullying occurs in a department or faculty members when views are excluded, when conversations are held without or around a faculty member, when meetings are set up in a way that leads to a predetermined outcome without that faculty being involved, when faculty members are continually marginalized and diminished. And when repeated requests for information or conversations are ignored, it is bullying with a soft voice. Now, a single incident, and this is why it's so insidious, a single incident or a couple incidents of these sorts does not rise to the level where Title IX or HRR would concern itself with it. But over time, it creates a toxic environment. And, and, a single incident is not enough to do anything about, but over time it just creates a horribly toxic environment. The third thing of interaction is to be aware of the micros. These are smaller bits of bigotry or discrimination, slurs, abuses, suppression, invalidation. Often, and I learned a lot about this by looking at critical race theory as it occurs to, um, to racism. And we use the isms to understand all the other isms dealing with mental health issues help me understand in a small way what, what uh, people of color are going through, what they have to deal with this and the pressure of having to be on and, and not be a part of that confirmation bias. And what I go through, I'm sure is just, I'm rambling here, but it helped me understand going through a mental health condition helped me understand in a small bit what the other types of bigotry and isms go through. Microaggression is brief verbal behavioral and environmental indignities, usually based on race, but it can be based on all of those things, all right? Indirect and subtle slights, slurs, humiliations. Microinvalidation. Oh, you're not qualified. Oh, you're only in that position because you're a person of color. That's micro-invalidation, meant to nullify, neglect, demean that person or that person's experience. Oh, you shouldn't believe that way. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. That's micro-invalidation. Micro-insults, subtle negative and demeaning comments. And micro assault, explicit and unintended derogatory comments or actions avoidance behaviors, or purposeful discriminatory acts. Those are the micros, and we need to be aware of those things. All right, mental health, the video lecture I hope never to have to make, but I made it. We need to address this more often.